Greetings, everyone. I'm Eric Hansen. On, on behalf of everyone here at OTTX, I'm delighted to welcome you to this episode of OTTX Videocast, The Buzz, where we offer up our online stage to a few streaming industry insiders to drop their version of the truth on us about what's going on, what it means, and what we should do about it in the tumultuous world of OTT streaming. Before we turn things over to this episode's crew of Buzzketeers, I want to make sure to mention that you can find and subscribe to all episodes of the Buzz via podcast on Spotify. Just search for OTTX. Be sure to follow us so you'll be notified about all future episodes as well. And tell your friends about us. We'd love to get more folks in the Buzzke sphere <laughs> involved. So we'll drop the Spotify link in the podcast in the chat so you'll be able to get in Easily. Um, all right. Well, let's get started. Presiding over today's group of OTT Rabble Rousers, we're excited to welcome our moderator, a longtime friend and partner of OTTX, TK Arnold. He is publisher and editorial director of Media Play News. Along with our panelists, an esteemed group themselves, Dave Burnett, Vice President of Sales and Partnerships at Whirl, Kyle Kazmarek, Founder and Chief Executive Officer at KDMG, Scott Olkowski, Co-founder and Chief Product Officer at Plex, Andrew Roseman, President of Arise Communications, and Gal Terzman, Chief Executive Officer at Castify AI. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. What a group, hey. honestly. Yes, we are all, all raring to go. And uh, I want to give you a personal uh, thank you, Eric, for introducing the panelists, because uh, I had a few problems with Kyle's last name there. Uh, so take a crack at it. <laughs> uh, Kazmarek. There you go. Great that job. That is it. Kazmarek, you're good. Okay. So, the, so the, this, okay. No C. Okay. Kazmarek. It's, okay. It's like, a, it's like Eric with the Kaz. You know. <laughs> nope. Nothing's quite like Eric. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway. Isn't that the truth. All right. Well, y'all have fun. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see you in about uh, an hour or so. Okay. <laughs> well, let's jump right in. Uh, you know, the neat thing is that, uh, again, I don't have to introduce the panelists' names, uh, and we can jump right into our discussion. And, uh, this week we have, uh, uh, several pretty hot stories to discuss that have nothing to do with Trump, Biden, or election, which is kind of welcome news to everybody, I think. So let me explain our agenda real quick. We're going to take a look at several recent news stories of interest to anyone in the streaming space and share our thoughts and perspectives. We've got about 10 minutes for each story. And then to wrap things up, we're going to do a round robin in which I ask each of you to briefly talk about one particular news story that somehow resonated with you. And again, when I talk about news story, the, the the, the round robin is for stories that we did not talk about earlier in today's session. We want to keep things fun and interesting and not shy away from controversy. So please keep it real and speak your mind. Let's jump right in with our first story, the one that everybody's talking about. The sale of Paramount Global to a group of investors led by Skydance Media, the company behind Transformers and, of course, Mission Impossible and Top Gun. It's been a 10-month on-again, off-again courtship that as recently as, as four weeks ago was off. And in the meantime, uh, Paramount has been uh, scrabbling to uh, cut costs, and we've seen the loss of a number of top executives, uh, including Bob Bakish, the uh, CEO, uh, for the last five years. Uh, with the Skydance media sale, it looks like it's finally a done deal. And uh, we want to talk about what it means for us, specifically about Paramount streaming properties, which of course has been led by Paramount Plus, but also includes Pluto on the uh, fast side. So who wants to go first and talk about this momentous occasion? I'll, I'll go first. Uh, okay. Since, since I spent 12 years at Viacom um, and I was then Viacom, I was the GM of Comedy Central actually when Sherry was fighting with Philippe Dumont to get the company back. And uh, then we got rid of him, thank God. Um, and uh, Bob took over. This was like 2016, 2017. So it's it's near and dear to me since I spent more than a decade working there. And uh, 
as far as what it means for the streaming side, I mean, uh, it's good news if what we read about increased investment and attempt to compete with the Netflixes of the world is true, then it's certainly good for P plus as they call it. Um, Pluto, maybe not quite as clear, but would seem to be generally positive, you know, in that sense. Um, but it, it does raise the question of the arms dealer versus streaming competitor, which comes up all the time with these companies trying to follow Netflix or compete with the tech giants. Uh, and so it could have gone the other way. Could have gone more of a uh, break things up or be, go back to more of the Sony model. But it appears from what we've read that there's going to be uh, a lot of investment in the streaming side. So that's probably a good thing. Well, l let me ask you, Dave, um, you know, we talk about the, the arms model, you know, which for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's basically uh, a studio like Sony. In fact, a studio that is Sony that does not have its own mass market streaming service, but instead sells its content or licenses its content off to the highest bidder. Uh, and then you've got uh, the other studios, you know, Warner, Disney, everybody else that does have their own streaming service. Paramount kind of has been a unique model because Paramount Plus has never quite reached the level of a Netflix or even a Disney Plus, or it could be argued a Max. Uh, and at the same time, Paramount has continued to license content, maybe more aggressively th than the other studios. So I think the big question here is, looking back, was, was Paramount right in launching its own streaming service, or should it have pursued a, an arms dealer mentality like Sony? I mean, you know, personally, I, I think at a high level, the way I look at this whole issue, I mean, you know, I was there as we all fed Netflix and helped it grow, you know, before House of Cards, before Orange is the New Black. And the checks were huge. And everybody at the studios and the cable networks kind of was hooked on that money. But we were obviously helping Netflix become the giant that it became. And they've just done such an amazing job. They've turned everything on its head. But I, to me, the challenge is, um, and then when you throw in the Apples and the Amazons, is you have a, a non-hockey stick business trying to compete with this tech hockey stick growth exponential kind of idea of what success looks like. Uh, and I think that's that's a real challenge because people are have been maybe chasing a model or a curve or some kind of Netflix-like stock you know, path that probably is unrealistic for these companies. Doesn't mean they don't have good businesses that you know are great to work at and do a lot of you know make a lot of entertainment for global audiences, but I'm not sure that 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 path for them is realistic. And so I feel like maybe it was a mistake for some of these companies to try to follow that model. And you look at what Sony's done. Um, you know what's wrong with being a great studio, making fantastic TV shows and movies, and, and making quote, quote unquote making a living out of it at a, at a decent level, rather than trying to sort of follow that tech uh, growth curve. Um, so that, that's how I see it. Um, uh -huh. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? I don't know. I mean, I think Paramount Plus is one question. Pluto clearly seemed like a pretty solid move, right? Like that seemed like <laughs> that's worked out pretty well so far. It definitely feels like we're the future. You know, it'll be a big part of the future. Um, you know, would you have done Pluto without Paramount Plus? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think there's you know a lot of woulda, coulda, shoulda. Um, there's just no doubt competing with Netflix and Amazon and and others is a you know a way to a pretty quick way to start a money bonfire. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not talking Pluto. I'm talking really the streaming. Yeah, I think Pluto was a fantastic acquisition and a great hedge against the decline of linear. Um, so I think Pluto was it was an awesome move, and it's been a, been a great thing for them. How is Pluto viewed in the uh, in the ad supported space? What is the perception of Pluto? I think it's pretty strong. I mean, you know, uh, Paramount was able to bring all their advertising, you know, activity across all the cable networks that need more eyeballs. Pluto was growing. You know, linear lives. You know, we used to think linear was going to die. 10 years ago, and it's lived on as a use case for viewers. So I think it's been been a net positive for them, for sure. Cer certainly seen as one of the leading platforms. It's one of the yeah, biggest we, in the U.S., you know. We, we definitely have a tremendous amount of respect for what they've done. You know, when you look at where 
when Pluto started and where it is today. I mean, it's just an incredible story and an incredible consumer offering. And, you know, there's the world's changing quickly. So I think they're going to have to keep adapting as well. But, you know, they've, they've done a really outstanding job. Yeah. Let's hear from some of the other panelists. Yeah, I'll chime in. Um, I, you know, personally come from the mindset. I think that um, differentiation in the market is is important. Um, I've not been biggest fan of basically creating, uh, as Dave kind of put it, this this giant that Netflix is. Um, I feel like the studios and and networks get caught up on that that addiction uh, to cash. But when you're looking at um, a publicly traded company that you know has to hit those those margins and and show that you know ROI, they're kind of backed in the corner a bit. But I I think you know Paramount having a Paramount Plus, sure, I think it's 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 okay. It's good to have their own platform. The key with this comes down to is how is this managed? What is the strategy with that? And I think that's where um, some of the studios have kind of floundered a bit. Uh, they try to replicate what Netflix is. And again, as they point out, it's a tech. You can't do that. You know, you can't say you're you're a creative in production media and then you're going to try to, oh, I'm going to get into tech all of a sudden and mirror that experience. I think they have to kind of figure out what is their play. Is there the windowing? Is it the coming up with their own um, segmented originals or, or hold back before they go to Netflix? But I, I believe there's a lot of opportunity and space out there. Um, uh, for differentiation in the market. Uh, I think the more we empower the one or two uh, to dominate, we're, we're just kind of beholden to them. And uh, that's kind of where things are at right now. And I think that's why it's a, a, a big struggle for them. Right. I, Kyle, I have to say that from the ad tech perspective, I don't think Netflix did a, a wrong move trying to build their own uh, Ad tech stack, and I think that it might be a good news for um, P plus, as they've called them, and and to uh, Pluto TV, because if uh, Skydance is going to bring on the the technology angle, and maybe even go towards the same approach as Netflix and build their own ad tech stack, so it might be bad news for the SSPs, it might be bad news for the ad servers companies, but it might be. Good news for Pluto TV and for P Plus, and I think there's a, a positive thing about it uh, there. Yeah, I, I would agree. And and to be clear, I think there's a space for everyone. I just think we need to be careful on how much we em, empower one um, platform or another, one provider or another. Yeah. Uh, I, I, again, I use the the you know, model of what the old DVD days were. If you, if y'all, I feel like I'm aging myself here <laughs> and saying that, but, but it, you, you know what, what, what that happened for, for the studios. So, you know, but I agree. I like that idea of the ad stack. And I think that's critical. I think if you're going to have a platform, you have to have um, your own ad set. But beyond that, you, you really have to have an ad team. You have to have an in-house ad team. That's not only going after your, um ad inventory that's being served up to you but you also have to look at what is the local opportunity and that's something that i'm always kind of been curious is are, are, is there going to be an opportunity to recreate what radio has dominated you know a lifetime ago because i think there's a lot of revenue opportunity in local markets that you can bring in and monetize uh since we have the technology that you can serve up for you know the dallas market or the chicago market or what have you beyond the straight national so I'm definitely excited to see where that goes. Uh -huh. That's an inter interesting perspective. Uh, you know, it, it should also be noted that, you know, I mean, obviously every streamer wants to be Netflix and that that can be said of, of everybody, you know. Uh, and yet Netflix was a technology company first and only got into the content business when uh, the studios realized, you know, hey, what the hell are we doing? We, we, you know, we've just been building our our tomb, um, you know, by giving them all of our content. Uh, and and these other companies, I mean, they were all content providers first, and then shifted into uh, technology and and the whole uh, uh, internet distribution. 
And I think they had to play very fast catch up because for years, uh, while there was a lot of build up and while Netflix was perfecting its technology, studios didn't care. They were selling DVDs and Blu-ray discs and making so much money that all of their uh, R&D into uh, digital delivery took a back seat. Where is it going to play out? What are we going, what will Paramount be a year from now? Will there be a Paramount Plus? Not everybody at once, please. A year yes. from now? Absolutely. A year, a year is nothing. I mean, it's going to yeah, take okay. a little while to close this thing and come in. And so, yeah, I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> for one, I think year. something Kyle said resonated with me, which is, you know, people kind of need to find their lane a little bit here. And I think Netflix has kind of proven they're going to be the premium lane, right? But if you look at share of wallet, you look at what people mm. can afford. I just think, you know, it's the reason why all these, you know, ad supported tiers are coming out. It's like the bottom line is we're in, you know, to get what you want. It's we're starting to get right back to where we were years ago before all this happened. <laughs> and you know, you get these really outrageous, expensive cable bundles. And it's just, it's not necessarily what you want. <clears throat> so my guess is you got to go back and look at the original business case and business models for like a P plus and say, you know what, maybe we're not going to get that same subscription rate. We're going to have to find a way to get this down, make it more affordable and get it into more homes where the advertising starts to make sense. You know, uh, just listening and talking about going back and Speaking of feeling old and talking about DVDs, there is uh, an imperfect history of content companies trying to transform into technology companies. I mean, you've got everything from, you know, BAM Tech, that was one of the original uh, that you just don't hear about anymore the way it got absorbed in. Um, you know, HBO, its first sort of uh, it was the first incarnation of that. You know, that was the darling tech from the content side. The content side doesn't necessarily have the um, same experience maintaining and updating platforms the way the tech side always has. Um, and so when entertainment comes and says, great, we're gonna we're gonna build out this thing, it's not, it's not like it goes into an edit studio, comes out, here's our final cut, and then we get to window it and distribute it. When you're building tech, you have to constantly, it, it needs care and feeding. And I think it's it's a bit of a, you know, like I'm curious what Scott thinks and, you know, Gal thinks and everybody thinks. I mean, I think we've all seen that there's a great initial effort sometimes on behalf of entertainment companies to put some tech into market to distribute their stuff. And maybe just culturally, they're not built to uh, sustain it the same way. Yeah. Real quick, I, I, on. Sorry, I just, want to, I just want to throw something out there real quick. Um, I think it's it's fascinating that we haven't talked about MTV, Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, you know, because this company, or even CBS for that matter, we go back a little chunk of time. The studio was the laggard, right? The, the movie, that was the problem. And the cash cow was cable. Mm -hmm. and I think that the double whammy of what you said, Andrew, is, you know, about, and we used to say as, at Viacom, like, we're not a tech company. You, you know, we, we shouldn't try to be. But it's been not just the chasing Netflix, but it's been the, the disinvestment in the cable uh, networks and even the broadcast networks. You can say it was, you know, maybe a wise move, but other folks like A&E, are still cranking out an incredible amount of original content to support their cable networks. Yes, they've lost subscribers, but compared to what's happened, say, at Comedy Central or at the Warner Brothers, the TNTs, you know, it's not just trying to do, you know, Max and, and Paramount Plus, but also saying that's where we're going to make all of our new shit, um, to be crass, sorry. But, uh, you know, that's where we're going to make all of our new content. We're going to pull it off the cable network. So you hasten that decline while you may be chasing an unrealistic goal and you almost compound the issue in real time. And, uh, you know, it's, it, like I say, it's interesting that we're talking about this company. We're not talking about what heretofore was where most of the money was, which was in the cable networks. All right, I'm done on Paramount. <laughs> That's a good point. Okay. I, and I think given the time that we are all done with Paramount right now. So in other words, the, the consensus seems to be what's going to happen. We don't know. <laughs> If I can summarize things neatly, which is is pretty valid because, you know, the history of, of home entertainment or digital entertainment, whatever you want to call it, 
you know, has been full of, we don't know. And things change so fast and so quickly and so dramatically that, you know, it's no wonder that for years the studio executives were concerned about short-term profits and they gave away all their content to Netflix because they made a ton of money in the quarter. There were no concerns about long-term ramifications. But let me get off my soapbox here and let's move on to our second story. Comcast unveils $10 a month Spanish language streaming package. And that kind of gives us the chance to, uh, you know, move into a different uh, uh, topic of conversation, which is the broader concept of niche programming and specifically uh, the Latino audience which I think we all are agreed is, is pretty huge. How important is the Latino audience and what steps are streamers taking and should they be taking to reach this audience? And Scott, you're gonna go first because you're right up there on my screen. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a super important audience and it's really exciting to see. I'm actually really excited about the Comcast announcement. I think it's a good move. I, again, back to that, like finding the right price points for the right audiences is key. And you do that by, you know, kind of, you know, over providing for a niche, right? And, and this is an example of that. I think that price, you know, is a good starting point. They mm -hmm. have other packages a little higher up with more. I think they'll do well there. The For me, for us, you know, it's, we, we are definitely starting to really, figure out enough content is coming into the ad supported space for this audience that we're really excited about where it's going to go over the next year between the fast channels and the AVOD stuff and just every, you know, it's, it's happening across all sorts of, you know, when you call them audiences or niches, but that is, I think, going to be an explosive one. Yes. Anybody else? I, I mean, Scott summed it up perfect. I agree hundred percent. Um, Absolutely. The Latino market is huge. Um, you have to be there. You have to service that demographic. Like you have to serve, you know, LGBTQ and other, you know, Epoch and all these other demographics. It's not just like the, the one trick anymore. So I, I do believe there's a lot of opportunity for 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 niche oper niche opportunity, niche market play. So I think Comcast is being smart. And let's face it. You know, being the largest MSO, they they know their demos, they know the homes, they know their audience. So, uh, and 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 here's the thing with like KDMG in particular, you know, where a lot of people have shifted away the focus from yes, the old pay and video and transactional premium windows. I've steered the company still. Hey, let's respect that because you know you're talking about these you know giants these. Um, leviathans of of cable telco and satellite they're not just gonna you know fall on the sword and, and and take a bath on everything they've slowly probably been watching and seeing how do they come reinvent themselves how do we come back into here to still have a play and be relevant and 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 that's what i think quietly they've been doing so rolling this out i think it was a smart play the timing was right for it and i think we're gonna see more of that as, as we move forward, especially from the MSO side. Are there uh, any- call the Latino market, the niche market, but I totally agree. I mean, again, from a very narrow perspective of the ad tech or the ad sales size, it, it's, it's great news that the market is going towards segmentation, contextualization, so, and that's perfect for us. If you would have a platform that you know you're aiming the right audience, be it on a contextual level or on a, a demographic level, so at the end of the day, Latino market in the U.S. or outside the U.S., good news. I think um, just as someone who's currently buying um, CTV for a customer who's looking for you know multicultural and Hispanic households, um, it's we should remember also it's not it, it, it it's fairly nuanced, right? You have multi generational households that are multilingual, um, so the the Latino market quote is, uh, you know, highly, uh, you know, you, you start digging underneath it. It's, it gets pretty complex. I think to the point earlier that Comcast knows what it's doing. I think like most of the distributors, they're seeing their subscriber counts decline, you know, rapidly right, across the board. So to offer something into uh, a population that maybe necessarily was underserved, prior 
um, I think it I think it makes sense. I think you have less penetration with Spanish dominant households by dominant MSOs and MVPDs, and so it makes sense for them to conform a product for customers who are underserved. Um, so I I sort of agree, but I also know from a, from an advertising perspective, it's no, nobody's saying, oh yeah, just give me some of that. Like it's a you know, and Gal, you know better than anyone how how detailed this stuff can be. So. You know, I, I wonder if it's also just an interesting step towards lower cost, unbundled, you know, collections of content. If, if if Comcast can be really successful with this, does it become a blueprint for doing this for other audiences where maybe the shackles of having to have, you know, that whole, you know, the halo of all these channels that then drive up all the costs and make it impossible. If this, if this is successful, this becomes you know, a really interesting model forward for folks that have, you know, these channels that are are seeing the subscriber counts go down. It might just show a way forward. Well, they have a unique advantage also because their footprints are, you know, more major NFL cities, right? So they probably looked across their footprint and said, yep, we've got audiences that we traditionally haven't penetrated. I, I'm not sure the Satcasters or even a charter or even in any of the other smaller you know, MSOs, I don't know that the map works the same for them to be able to do the offer. Uh, and who knows? I mean, Comcast is busy trying to get out of their footprint with the with with their devices and the Zumo Flex device and all that. So uh, it's fascinating. They're they're going deep where they are, but they're also trying to get out of it. I was curious about a ten dollar markup, and is that to follow on Netflix or is that to plan ahead on, on uh, other niche uh, uh, audiences and then set the, set the price for $10 plus ads? And I mean, if that's the case, Scott probably can slice his uh, 1,000 fast channels into, I don't know, 200 bundles and sell them each for $10. Not bad. Yeah. Start to see a little bit of the future, I think, when you talk like that, right? I mean, Comcast is kind of just an interesting company that is, you know, content and technology, right? Where you're seeing kind of this combo um, play out in, in different ways, and you know, I think it's, hmm. I think they're an interesting one to keep an eye on because they have they have some of those combo muscles. How, how is the mix going to evolve? I mean, you know, the fact that Comcast, I mean, Comcast is not one of the uh, established leaders, you know, the pure play, the television or the the Televisa, the Univision, uh, they're, they're not a, a, they don't come from the Latino background. Uh, they're a, they have a mass market approach to everything they've done. Uh, how will that play out? Uh, and do you think there is room for, streaming services that are aimed at Latinos that do not have only or ex or mostly Spanish language product. Uh, I mean, for example, you know, Latinos, they enjoy a lot of the same programs that other people do, uh, especially on the sports front. You know, how, how will the pure play streamers square off against the broader ones like Comcast? Scott, I'm looking at you again. I know. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's it's that same ability you have. If you have a really strong platform and you have the relationships with the content providers, I believe that you're going to find a market come together here, right? You have enough of the ingredients, right? You've got, you can start to, there's, as Gail said, there's, there's a ad market opportunity here to, to exploit that. There's, you know, the ability to find the right subscription price to make it work. I, I to me, this is the future. And I think you'll, and it, you know, there's, it's not going to be a million of these, but there's going to be more at this price point is my, is what, my what do you think the reaction is over at Televisa Univision headquarters? I don't, I don't think they're happy. I think it's got to be good. That's my that's my guess. I'm not there. I don't know. But to me, this is a positive way to reach more people, and right. it's it's going to it's going to benefit them over time. I, I yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think they're supportive, believe it or not. You know, the one thing yeah. it's it's great to see in the Latin Hispanic culture um, um, market is the the culture is very supportive. It's very welcoming and embracing and expanding. So I think there's going to be support for that as opposed to, to resistance. Um, and one other thing I want to say about Comcast too is let's not forget 
what does Comcast own? You know, they have a studio. You know, they have a stream play. That's true. They, 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 they have, they know, and, and again, it gets back to that, that sleeping giant uh, model. You know, they've been slowly watching, seeing, and, and aligning themselves. So I expect that this is just a start point. And I believe, and I agree with you that the, the price is a bit of what's been established, but also setting a precedent for themselves too. So it's it, it's going to be great to see. I, I don't think this is going to be the last. Right. Bye. Okay. And Kyle, I'm glad you used the word sleeping giant because that brings us into our third story for today. And it's funny because I've been following Fast since it came out. And and first we 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 had people going, wait a minute, isn't this like a return to network television? I don't want to watch commercials. Then we said, oh, people like to watch. They don't mind commercials. They're more budget conscious. And then we saw a flurry. I think every every few days, a different research house came out with different and higher uh, projections about how well Fast was doing. And then all of a sudden, we began seeing pushback, and uh, especially you know at panels at at OTTX and and other trade groups. Um, you know, well, you know, let's not be too hasty because the money is not that big and it's kind of slow and coming, and you got to be around for three or three to five years before you can really be profitable. And then everybody is saying, well, maybe fast isn't the answer. And now we have this big article on MSN calling fast the sleeping giants and saying fast is the future. Which is it or is everything a little bit true? Okay. And well, <laughs> this, is a, this is a pain point part of what I'm going through right now. Um, I will say that yes, fast is, I definitely think, uh, a big part of the future. Um, um, one stat showed recently that by 2028, it'll far eclipse SVOD and subscriptions there. And I think it's in part dependent on consumers' continuation or adoption of it. And um, also a big part of FAST is because of the, the ad model. That's where we make our money. Right. It's, it, the CPMs are really a commodity. So we are again beholden to to the markets in the in the economy by and large. So think of it as your CPMs are like coffee, or they're like timber, or they're you know uh, like to you know, cotton, whatever uh, textile. So if if the market is is doing great, people are traveling a lot, people are buying things, cars, houses, stuff like that. The big ad agencies are going to have bigger budgets and spending. They're going to be more free with that. Yay, our CPMs go up. But when you have this, this kind of stagnant market we're in right now, and the CPMs are are, are, are lower than, um, I would say, even you know during COVID or pre-COVID, uh, it, it, it's a bit challenging for people that are trying to get into that space or, or make it viable because you, you have to, A, you got to have a certain volume amount of content to even justify a channel. And then let's face it, you got to be carried by um, some of the majors, uh, you know, like uh, Vizio, Roku, LG, Samsung. It's very hard to get into because they're very much closing off. And <clears throat> then you have that ad part that you can't really control to a degree, unless you get back to what I said earlier about the Comcast is, you know, you make that investment saying, I'm going to hedge here. I'm going to bring in my own ad team. And I'm going to focus on local marketing where you can keep more of that lion share to to offset, <laughs> you know, your channel. Then I can I can see it work. But there's several components here that kind of have to align beautifully to be harmonious. <laughs> let's just say. And so, um, but overall, it, it is is it a great offering, great product? I think from a consumer point, absolutely. I mean, they have more than anything they could ever want now. You know, uh, in in terms of content consumption. And so I, I think it's going to continue to evolve, but not without its pain points. Uh, and we just got to keep keep mindful that the market it does dictate those CPMs. That is very much like a commodity. And if we come with that framework, we we shouldn't be too surprised. Um, I think in your uh, doc pre me pre this call, TK, you, I think you phrased it like, did it grow too fast or were we ready for it? Or was it a, you know, was it too soon or grew, grew too yeah. fast? Uh, to me, I look at it like 
The answer is no from a viewer point of view because people are embracing it. Yes, from an advertising ecosystem, holding company, sales process, no currency, et cetera. Um, and so we flat out have the eyeballs. We just ain't monetizing them as well as we should as an industry. And it's very frustrating. Um, and uh, I hope it gets better sooner rather than later. But um, but I think in some ways we weren't really ready for it. You know, there's a lot of ad slate on all these great services full of really good content that people are watching. And, uh, you know, it's just not being monetized as well as it should be. Uh, you know, I think the other thing I would say about the CPM thing, I mean, Kyle's point, broadly speaking, having been in the cable business for 20 years, obviously advertising goes up and down with the economy. But what I'm hoping doesn't happen um, is that we follow kind of the digital web, you know, race to the bottom on pricing. Uh, we, we instead capitalize on what gals referred to, the contextual possibilities, the targeting possibilities and there, I think the promise is incredible, but again, how to make it operational, how to make it, you know, so that the money can flow. The advertising business, you know, I have to find the right way to put it. You know, it's like there, there's inertia there. You know, you got to make it easy for people to buy CTV. Um, and it's not. So that's just got to be fixed because the people are watching. The viewership's going to continue to grow. Free is an awesome product. Uh, but um for the folks uh, to the point made about monetizing your channel and what platforms you're on, there's just, there's not as much money flowing through as there should be given the viewership. You know, here, here for Dave B for saying out loud, a lot of people, you know, are thinking, and I think we heard something similar. Uh, the other, I, I, I want to bring up the idea of, yeah, there's, there's price suppression around, CTV inventory, there's a lot of it. Like we haven't reconciled the amount of inventory with the amount of demand. But I think what part of what you're saying, Dave, like don't let me put words in your mouth is, you know, there's, I don't want to be a cynic. And I think a lot of, a lot of digital advertising is cynical uh, where they know the price of everything, the value of nothing. And considering the amount of, let's just say, um, unscrupulous actors in the digital space, my greatest concern is that the premium inventory that's available on CTV platforms and from CTV publishers is maintained and sustained. And then the value, the CPMs will follow, follow the perceived value. I think the, the risk profile that we have right now is an industry with big six agency hold codes. I'm a recovering hold co guy myself who's now you know buying into this space as, as, as an independent. Um, is that we, I think you're right, we overcomplicate it. I think there, <laughs> somebody published something on LinkedIn for their can session where they're, they're opening caveats where it's all very complicated and we're not going to solve anything. And that was the opening of their CTV session, which just sort of floored me that like you're, what, what, what you're expressing to the gathered, you know, uh, lucky folks on your yacht is that you don't know what you're going to do with this. That's, that's not the best thing. Um, so to me, I think we all have a collective responsibility to make sure that the value of the premium content on these platforms, the value of those households that are tuning in is properly articulated back to the buy side because the buy side's smart, right? They, they, they buy what helps them move product. But the more intermediaries and the more complexity that we throw in there, Dave, I got to agree, like the harder it is for them to transition from broadcast commitments up front to more dynamic, even programmatic real-time commitments uh, against what's happening in the market. And so, um, you know, if anybody, <laughs> like, sorry for the rant, but this is just what I've been thinking about. No, you know, and, and that kind of, that kind of got me thinking about uh, in terms of business models, one of the biggest uh, fast channel providers and also a huge leader in ABOT, I'm not going to mention the name, but they pride themselves on not selling ads, just providing the content and figuring out which content will appeal to the advertisers. Other operators are actively involved in the ad sales section. Uh, which is better? Or does it really depend on what the company wants to do? As long as they get the feel right. Yeah. 
it's, it's, it's about, you know, getting driving yield, right? Like it's about driving the business. And if you can make it work one, you know, one, I think we're in this world right now where there's so many models, like every single partner of ours is a competitor right? right. There's, right. you know, they're, they're the number of whether it's an intermediary or different approaches to achieve similar things has exploded, right? And it's not mm -hmm. just CTV, it's, you know, in general. Um, and having these, you know, content provider, like Comcast is kind of this perfect example, right? They're a studio, they're a cable company, they're a, you know, they got Peacock, they got, you know, this bundle, they, you know, they, they got everything. And there's just a lot, we're in this churn phase of this market, right? Like with all the stuff we've been working towards for many, many years to get to here is still, you know, it's exciting. There's a real market developing, but it's going to take another year or two for things to shake out. The amount of inventory that's come online just this year alone is absolutely staggering right you know so how do you how do you how do you really know i don't think anyone really knows where we are right it's really hard to get a finger on a bead on our you know what are what are things really looking like and are we dealing with you know, one of the things like a simple little microcosmic thing here is what's one of the promises of ctb frequency capping right so are we you know are we like you know is there less demand because of frequency capping or is the demand the same as it used to be? I don't even know. Like no one can tell me the answer to some of this stuff. And I think there's just so many of those variables to make it hard to divine exactly where we are. What I'm confident in is that we're going to get through this. We're going to get the other side. Yeah, some of the players are going to shake out. Some of the models might just not work as well, but we're going to get there. And I think we're just about a year to two years away from seeing those things take shape. Who do you think are some of the best fast providers? distributors or, or channel providers <laughs> what is, either one or or, or us, ssai you know folks like world there's a lot us, of people give, in this give us some examples of i i think on the distribution end and, and the content supply uh you know the the realm of film rise uh, uh cineverse companies like that what are some of the companies that seem to be doing you know that are are doing things right well, I'm going to let Dave go. <laughs> I mean, clearly, all of the clients who work with Whirl, like A and E, AMC, and Bloomberg, they're just doing they're doing great. Um, yes, as they no, should. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I think that that A and E in particular has been a leader. You know, they went from one to four to now, you know, twenty twenty plus channels. Uh -huh. They've been aggressive. They've been smart. They've really been in it for a while. Um, AMC as well. I think they're both as independents. Um, you know, cable groups trying to figure out how to survive as as medium, small size companies compared to the the studios. I think they've both been very aggressive, but in a smart way. You know, it's been interesting to watch the Warner Brothers and the NBCUs come off the sidelines. You know, in year five, year six, um, and and you know have s some level of success. They also came in, I think, a little bit like, yeah, we'll get 30, 40 channels on. And uh, it hasn't always been the case. You know, they've gotten some big volume plays, but they're hitting the same realities as everybody else. But I think when I think of AMC and a &E in particular, just because of their independent status, I, I think they've done a great job. And they're also both very aggressive when it comes to controlling sales rights to inventory. Right. You know, uh, it's all, you know, it's always going to be apples and oranges. We have no sub fees, you know, and we have ads. It's programmatic. It's not it's done by the traffic department. So it's not the same as cable. It's not cable 2.0. But one thing that at a high level always kind of fascinates me is just the shift in power and control of selling. Um, you know, at a cable network, you routinely would have 12, 13 minutes, put a few more minutes in there to hit your goal if you need to in the quarter. And uh, the MSO and VPD's got two or three minutes. So what's that percentage? You know, 85, 15, you know, to the content owner. And we live in a world now where even major companies are like, yeah, we'll just let the platform sell it. We, don't, we can't figure this out. We're not confident. Or we'll do an inventory split. We'll get half the inventory or 60%. So it's been an incredible shift in control of, you know, selling the inventory. And obviously, if it's programmatic, you know, and it's run in a certain way, it, it, you're not necessarily direct selling. But but ultimately, uh, the people who make these things generally know how to sell it better. Um, and so I think it's been good to see um, A&E and AMC in particular, since I know more about their business because they're big strategic clients of ours, be very aggressive in trying to continue to sell the advertising around their content, which I think is good for the space. Yeah, that's a good point. TK, I want to be a bit provocative here and ask who is who poses a threat to hold back the growth of the fast channels? And I 
may offer a, an answer to that. If you look at the uh, platforms, and I'm not referring to uh, Scott with, with Plex, but to Pizio and Samsung and LG and, uh, and the likes, PC. and the way they control whatever fast channels are on their platform and the way they kick out channels, etc. So that poses a big threat to fashion and so or to diversity and the variety, especially we were discussing uh, only a few minutes ago about the, the niche uh, market of uh, um, um, the, the Latin market, sorry. And then came up the question of, okay, but within the same household, you might have, uh, you know, different generation and some of them want to watch other type of contents and that's where fast is a good answer for that as a free choice along with a ten dollar subscription or whatever um, so that's one thing and the other thing is that we tend to speak about fast channels offering all the time but we uh, keep forgetting that the same platforms also offer on-demand content which is also has uh, growth in viewing and actually uh, the form of the on-demand content, especially if it's a CTV app, can provide a solution or an answer for the continuous growth of the fast channels. Uh, and the simple way to do that is to just integrate a linear channel within each app that would put together that specific content from all genres or even several linear channels within the CTV app. And then you leave it up to the viewer to decide and you don't have the limitation of uh, you know, a, a, a choice, a, a, a closed selection of, of, of uh, fast channels that you as a platform uh, offers to your viewers. So Gal, I think, I think you're right. And I think we should take the platforms at their word when, I, and I think we have to acknowledge this and, and Dave, you touched on this also that you would, you know, all MVPDs, all cable MVPDs effectively had the same 200 plus networks, right? So you had national reach across all points of distribution and cable. But we should take the CTV, you know, these gatekeepers, these, you know, OEM device manufacturers and the plug in device manufacturers at their word that they're starting to service different constituencies. So now there is a programming overlay with what they're selecting, what they're allowing into their EPGs and the apps that they're promoting and the channels they're promoting. So you'll have these, and you know, Scott, again, you probably know it better because you run one of these platforms. Um, there's gonna be the Plex style of, right? Here, here's what we've curated and what LG and the others. So you've got these differentiated experiences across the differentiated access points and that's new right that it, it used to not matter who your cable company was you get kind of the same channels but it seems like there's a trend and they all seem to be saying we're looking at our data our first party data and we're making these decisions about what's on our air and what we promote so now you have a that that that's a trend towards a more fractured experience for consumers and less ubiquitous which may go back to why it's harder to get those dollars to translate over might, might be adding some friction. Yeah, I'll um, just chime back in on this one because I've, I've thought about this and talked about it a lot um, you know, on panels and whatnot, which is just the the lack of that of that building of national brands. You know, I mean, I mean a lot of what happens in digital disintermediates brands. You know, people watch Broad City on Hulu. They don't even know it's Comedy Central. If you're going back like 10 years. So some of that uh, and what Gal talked, on, talked about, sort of the experience becoming more personalized, feeds, do channels even need to exist? I think all that's out there. But in the short term, despite whatever they say, quite frankly, I think it's just human nature to want to meddle and make it your own in some way. I don't think it really, you know, first of all, no one's going to buy a TV because of the fast lineup. Uh, you know, they're going to buy because of picture and price, period. So um, it, it feels like it's human nature on some level, maybe economic, right? Why not create a Vizio home channel that we have 100% of the inventory and pull together content. So, um, it you know, in, in the sense that digital keeps breaking down what brands mean, I can't be too nostalgic or feel like it's a missed opportunity, but from a kind of common currency, advertising scale, you know, I would, I wish there was, and there is to some extent, right? The Walking Dead universe and Bloomberg are on all of the ones that you mentioned, Andrew, but I, I, I do think there's a, something's getting lost 
by them, by people trying to be too unique with their, uh, their free offerings. And I think a little bit of, you know, uh, ubiquity, the word you use would probably be good for the industry. I'm not sure I buy the need for too much um, top down special personalization will change it, right? If all of our TVs do what gals referring to, it won't matter as much in five years, but the idea of like over curation. Um, and I say this as an ex programmer, I think uh, platform by platform is maybe not, yeah. not so much the, the right. Method. And we're kind of banking on that, Dave, <laughs> you know, our, our, you know, we're independent, we're trying to bring it all in, but then it becomes our job to help people discover the content. That's the, that's the hardest part here, right? Like, the hardest part, and yeah. I just, you look back and you're like, all right, what's the, what's the most successful streaming business? And it's the answer is YouTube. And what have they done? They've made personalization discovery absolutely awesome, <laughs> right? For people. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's that, if you want to look at the future, it's not going to be YouTube, but it's going to take the elements that make YouTube successful, which is huge array of content of varying different qualities and, and production and all that, but then helping people connect. And I think that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to, that's where we're headed. And we're in, you know, kind of the early days of making that work. But when you, when we do it well, we see it, it's very successful. People come back, they find other channels and other Ava that they like. And it's, it, you know, the feedback loop for us is very apparent. Like if you do that well, you know, you can, you can serve people and you drive dollars. You know, let, let me ask one question about, you know, because we've, we've seen two parallel developments. I mean, one has been the quick rise of, of fast and, and you know, the proliferation of channels and platforms. And then we've seen the connected TV where the TV guys, you know, get in on the on the whole game. Um, is the the rise of the connected TV, you know, and, and companies, you know, divisions like what Vizio is doing. I mean, they're clearly a leader in that field. Uh, Samsung TV Plus, LG, TZL. Um, is that making discovery easier or harder? Because discovery has always been a problem. You know, search has gotten very easy, but discovery has always been an issue. Yeah, I mean, I, my opinion is pretty simple. I don't think they're doing a great job yet. <laughs> I think they're going to have to improve that if they want to succeed. And my guess is they're going to do what Dave said, which is get more ubiquitous with the channel, or they're going to have you know wider array of channels to make the discovery work better. So my guess is that's where it ends up. But in the meantime, we're in this churn phase. Right. And we are running out of time, so we're going to have to skip the last question, the future of chicken soup for the soul. Um, maybe we can do some individual soul searching. Get it? Okay. Sorry. Been up early. Uh, so let's do the round robin and uh, let's each of you briefly for a minute or less talk about a story that particularly impacted you. And again, we're, that doesn't have Biden or Trump in the headline. Scott, you're on my screen again. You're first. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the one that I was looking at that I think kind of uh, resonated here was seeing Tubi announced that they're going to be going into the UK. That's, you know, for us, that's exciting, good news. As you start to see these markets, you know, it was US and Canada, then UK is, you know, kind of our third, you know, best market already. Um, but what we need is more people in the space, right? That helps us. It really does. You know, it's, it's competitive, but it's good for the market. So we're actually kind of thrilled to see them, you know, doing that. We, when we launched our AVOD and our fast stuff, it's been global, but frankly, you know, the markets aren't there for it, right? The users are coming, but the ad markets haven't been there and the content rights haven't always gotten there. So when we get more people in and some more, um, you know, kind of heft, it's good for us. It's good for the market. So we're excited to see that. Okay. Dave, let's have you go next. I'm going to go a little more narrow, but uh, the story that caught my eye was uh, Gavin Bridge, our fast master, joining Amazon and crossing over from being a uh, industry in research slash talking head panel, you know, a leader like uh, Evan or Alan to actually joining forces as an exec at one of the content companies. I thought that was pretty fascinating. So I wish him well, but that is that's something you do not see very often. Okay. Andrew. I, th I think for me, and this one's a little more tactical, um, was the trade desk and Yahoo kind of going back and forth somewhat publicly about, hey, you know, trade desk saying, hey, Yahoo, you got to clean up your stables, like what you're representing as CTV really, and you know, isn't, and then them saying it was, and then apparently making nice. I think that that was a view into a world I don't know that we always see. 
Um, but I think it's an important thing to have happened and that it kind of should, should, should get us all, you know, set up a little bit straighter and make sure that, you know, yeah, what's being represented in the marketplace as premium CTV really is. Uh, so I thought that was just a fascinating story. I don't know if anybody else did. Okay. Guy? Gal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually wanted to say one sentence about this. Uh... <laughs> what was that chicken soup for the soul and just in seriously in, in one sentence i think they had too much on their plate and i just want to remind us all as they started by selling books amazon started as selling books but not everyone is jeff bezos and i think the way they tried to put the whole thing together just didn't work uh and the thing that caught my eye i'm going back to february this year that's the the acquisition of visio by uh walmart and i don't think we truly understand the meaning of that yet <clears throat> we were talking about earlier about the 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 uh, um, acquisition or the merger of of uh, uh, um, paramount and and um, sky sky dance yeah and and I think the Walmart Visio um, deal is even more important than that in the sense that it brings a whole new player, giant player into the market and brings in the whole retail media, uh, retail, sorry, industry into the market with the retail media budgets and everything. And I think that we will be seeing more from that deal, but also maybe news from other retail players. Uh-huh. That's interesting. And last yeah, but certainly... The clock is ticking. There's the, uh, the Netherlands is playing England very soon. So I know you guys are not interested. You're in America. You got your own world. But here in the rest of the world, we're looking forward to that. Now, some of us are too. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Kyle. Yes. Um, for me, it's something I'm not surprised about from Portland, Oregon here. So I'm right in my back door. Really chuck a stone at there. Uh, campus headquarters, Nike. Uh, Nike is uh, been getting bludgeoned <laughs> quite a bit this week and last in, in the markets uh, with their earnings call. And what was surprising to me, um, and especially talking to 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 um, colleague friends who actually work there, name I'll mention their names, but um, one thing where Nike just kind of. I think rested a little bit too much on their laurels and not really innovating. And I mentioned this already in our call, you got to constantly be innovating. You cannot just stay stagnant. Um, and if you look at Nike's uh, track record in history, they got some great stable of brands, but when was the last time they brought out a, a really innovative product? And I think that shows um, their CEO, you know, coming from a consulting background has its merit, but um uh, you know, I, 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 as somebody who looking as an analyst, I, I would say that, you know, caution on shaking up your your house every four years. Um, that's not the best efficient means to uh, cash cutting and savings because you got to be cognizant of talent. And when you're in that type of, of business, talent is crucial especially if you're going to try to innovate because it ties into the culture, you know, and, and I'll say just real quick, then going back on chicken soup, they should have been cutting <laughs> from day one. They, they took should have, should have been what? Debt. chicken soup for the soul. I'll just say real quick. They took on way too much debt, right? They streamline. They had no synergies between their other products and they just kind of sat thinking, Oh, it's going to come back. Don't worry. It's good. We're going to, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. And no, so my, my word is innovate, 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 expand, and continue to grow. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Back to you, Eric. Hey, thanks a lot. Sage advice, Kyle. Thank you. And, and all of our, our buzz kateers today. A fantastic session. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and so thanks, uh, TK, Dave, Kyle, Scott, Andrew, and Gal um, for that deep dive into the enticing yet murky waters of streaming today and, um, and running shoes. I guess too. Uh, we'll be back again with our next edition of The Buzz on August 14th. You can register to, to attend this and future episodes from our website at ottx.org. 
Uh, um, and you can find our podcast on Spotify. I hope you'll join us and invite your friends and colleagues as well to get in on the buzz. Quick note to let everybody know that registration is now open for the OTTX Summit, one of our flagship conferences taking place in LA on September 25th and 26th. The event includes two days of conference programming, workshop breakouts, exhibitor booths, one of one-on-one -on -one meetings and the Heroes of OTTX Awards and much, much more. Uh, you want to be there to get on the inside track of the OTT ecosystem. You can find out about all this and other events on our website, ottx.org. So head out there now. We also um, want to invite you, if you're not yet a member of OTTX, please do consider all the options that we have available. We have membership tiers that... Uh, make becoming a member affordable and extremely valuable for everybody, um, basically anybody that, that wants to be. Um, so with that, uh, I mean, we're gonna close things off. That concludes our webinar. Thanks everyone and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Yes. Good night. Thanks.